All right, hello everybody. Welcome. Tonight is March 16th, 2022. This is the Upper Dublin School District Finance Committee and I will call the meeting to order. Uh, all four of the committee members are here. Uh, Mike Henderson is remote right over there for those who can see him. Hi, Mike. Um, and, uh, and we will uh, jump right in. Uh, no formal presentations tonight. Any announcements, Andy? The only announcement that I have is uh, since there's no formal presentation, I do want to acknowledge that we have uh, folks from our insurance company here tonight. So there's no presentation, but they are here if the board has any, um, the committee and board have any specific questions for them um, regarding the, the claim work at Fort Washington, the high school or our athletic fields. Any questions for Utica while they're here? Yeah. Maybe this is, you know, a, a question maybe more for ICF than Utica, but can we get an update on the baseball fields? Is that maybe more an ICS question? Uh, sure, our ninth grade field is ready to go. That's been groomed, uh, it's playable. We're working out there every day that it's, that it's dry, turning over the turf, uh, the infield. So th that's in good shape. Uh, the varsity, JV field uh, will be the next to come online. Uh, today, the fencing was released for uh, the first base side. For It's more of a safety fence for the players sitting on the bench. Uh, that was released today. That's in stock locally. Uh, we're looking to have that field playable uh, probably the next two to three weeks. Uh, the varsity field is very far out there still. Um, looking tentatively right now as an August date, uh, just because we, we're still six weeks out from the permit drawings being finished by the architect, uh, then they'd go for approval by the, to the township uh, and Williams pipeline, uh, so we can coordinate the underground pipelines under together. Then getting the material here and putting the fencing in, um, we have a good two to three months of work. I will just reiterate that Mr. Highland has alternate plans for all the games to be played. So this will not impact the season. Um, all the games are uh, covered. If anything, particularly with the varsity field, if anything should be uh, sped up, we'll make sure that we get on the fields. But there are at least, you know, the ninth grade field is ready to go. And as Mr. Lester said, within the next two weeks, the, the JV, JV field will be ready. Yeah, we also are allowing the fields to be used for practices. They've been doing some of their tryouts in the outfields. Um, they are able to use those areas right now. Mark, so can can the J can the varsity players play on the JV field if there isn't a conflict? I believe so. I can confirm with uh, Mr. Highland, but you know, from um, the time that we started talking to the boosters earlier this winter, we were clear that the JV field would come online first, and so that was sort of the top priority. All right, and oh, Darlene. So where, um, what other field is being used at either the JV or the varsity, depending what they decide? I know that we're using fields at Villanova, fields at Temple. I'm looking at Mr. Lef Lefman. Yeah, th those are the two that, that uh, Mr. Highland has available, Temple, Ambler, and Villanova. And I just want to remind everyone, um, you know, it's been mentioned more than once that we fixed the pool and we didn't do anything with the baseball fields, keeping in mind that the roof that's on the pool is a temporary solution right now, and it's also part of the physical structure of the high school. Unfortunately, the varsity baseball field was the path to get trees that needed to come down, so that field really sustained more damage than just the tornado uh, with heavy equipment running over it. And it's a particularly difficult field to work on because the gas lines run under that field. Any other questions for Utica? Not that those turned out to be questions for Utica, but. <laughs> all right, well, thank you all for coming. Um, uh, let's move on. We do have minutes from our February 23rd meeting. Uh, members of the committee prepared to accept those minutes? All right, yeah, that's a yes. Those will appear on the, uh, on the agenda next week as an informational item. And moving right on to reports and recommendations, starting with Food Service Department Grocery RFP. Yeah, so I'll just welcome Kristen Dully, our, who needs no introduction. She's gonna talk about the RFP uh, and the recommendation for the next steps. Evening, everyone. You hear me okay? So um, 
yeah, tonight I'm here to kind of go through our process of evaluating the RFP that we res um, we put out for the um, grocery and distribution for um, next school year. So I'll advance ahead. The opening was on the 18th. We had a public opening here. We welcomed representatives from the submitting organizations um, and our evaluation panel. Because we are, you know, 60 school districts are piggybacking off of this. This is a, a major RFP for the southeast part of Pennsylvania school districts. We involved eight uh, food service directors and assistant directors to be part of a, a panel so that we could look at this as a collective. We did receive three submissions. They were accepted and found whole. Uh, the first part of our public opening was uh, looking at the um, all the pieces that were required, <coughs> pardon me, um, and we ensured that they were before they moved into the evaluation phase. So what I'd like to talk about is the, I'm gonna start by talking about the two pieces that we used to make a determination. One was a questionnaire. Uh, that was, I had about 10 point value. And we also evaluated cost. There were 13 questions total in our questionnaire. Um, one through six had value, and seven through 13 were informational. Um, the cost, we received proposals, um, or excuse me, the proposals received a percentage of a weighted score. And essentially, we um, weighted the submissions based on the lowest proposal and then comparatively the other submitting proposals. How we determined a price was we calculated what we call the extended bid price. And this is the total units that we um, submitted as volume multiplied by the amount of units or volume or the case price towards those volumes that was submitted. So there were four parts essentially to this evaluation one. Part one, we received all the documents. We did receive them hard copy and digitally. We had the questionnaire evaluation, uh, the specification evaluation, which, which is how we made our cost determination, and then ultimately a simple scoring rubric. Our questionnaire evaluation found that the, of the three vendors, we had vendor one was Cisco, uh, vendor two was US Foods, Allentown, and vendor three was Gold Star. I would like to note that we're deeply appreciative of all of the um, submissions. Historically, we've received simply one submission. So this was a pretty competitive opportunity. Um, in the link provided, you would find the, the rubric, was it, which essentially outlines the maximum amount of points a lot, um, per question. And then we tried to make every um, decision as programmed as possible. So you'll see that the, um, the terms and what we were looking for is established in the responses, um, the corresponding responses. Uh, the results of the questionnaire found that US Foods received eight points um, on questionnaire points, Cisco seven and Gold Star three, uh, four, excuse me. I just wanna take a little bit more time to explain the process for evaluating the specifications. We had 927 specifications. Um, essentially, that's a ginormous task we take 927 times three submissions. So what we did is we used the panel and we broke down um, line items accordingly. So we just essentially split it up um, for the initial round of evaluation. The second round of evaluation meant that somebody was gonna get an entirely other uh, range of specifications to review. And then lastly, um, I verified all of the information was correct. Um, and then I had, uh, some support from Andy just doing a um, statistical analysis on any outliers. Sound very good for double checking my work. Um, what I do wanna say is what these um, responses looked like and what we have had to um, analyze are slightly different, so I'd like to explain that out. What we did is we really had to, each line item, we had to verify that the spec was met, that the correct volume was utilized to create an extended bid price, and we just had to ensure that, um, that and that there was, in fact, a response. And the reason we had to double, double check, especially um, and alter in some situations the correct volume given, was that if a response didn't have the appropriate amount of volume, then their extended bid price might not um, be 
um, as much as it should be. So let me give you an example. If we ask for 1,000 cases of turkey, the um, response should be the case price of 1,000 pounds or 1,000 cases of turkey. In a case of turkey, it could be 30 pounds. So we're looking at maybe $300,000. If somebody responds using a, um, a pound unit, then they paid 385 for a pound, 1,000 pounds. It's a different sum, and this would affect their extended bid price. So those were some of the modifications that we had to make. You'll see in the document that I've provided, and we're gonna hold on one second, Brooke, before we put that up, if you don't mind. We ensured that all original um, information was submitted, and then we noted any changes that we had to make to come up with a correct um, sum so that we could appropriately evaluate this. Another piece that we had to do is uh, remove any discontinued items. Clearly, that there, has been, there was a slew of discontinued items because of just market volatility. And then lastly, we assigned what, something that we called the 105% rule. And essentially what that is, is my way of um, equating non-submissions. So essentially, if you um, didn't apply this rule, which the rule is, if you don't put a submission in, I have to extend your bid price so that it's equal. So what I do is I take the highest submission and I apply 105%. Are there any concerns that you're having between one and two and three? I mean, really all of them that perhaps you couldn't quantify that while the numbers look like U.S. Foods is your top contender. Is there anything in there that you're concerned about that maybe one of the other did better? And No. No? I so have no concerns. We've, you, and, I'll, and let me support why I don't have concerns. One, we spent over 60 hours evaluating this RFP. 10 hands had, 10 hands had a, you know, a turn in this. We used, we used an initial evaluation. We used a reevaluation. I was a third evaluator, which I scoured this. And then we had Andy run the outlier statistics. And that, that was just to identify any, like, any line items that had like major percentile differences between the... And also for all the work that went into this, I think it's great that you took the lead. And, and the point I wanted to make, it's actually just more of a clarification for the anybody who may be looking at these numbers and, real, and seeing, you know, 29, 30 million, just to be clear, because we went over this in a prior meeting, this is a collective kind of, you know, yep. bargaining arrangement where yeah. you, it's multiple school districts going in together. I don't want people to be mm -hmm. yeah. looking at these numbers <laughs> thinking these are upper Dublin numbers that we're gonna be paying alone. It's just, you know. took the laboring or, you know, and, and we're the leader in kind of negotiating this right. and, and reviewing the proposals, right? Yes, yeah. with 59, so essentially our district is the lead agent on this RFP and 59 school districts are piggybacking, utilizing the piggybacking clause. And I will say, I think it's worth noting that um, even if you looked at this year's RFP results versus the last RFP results, which was uh, five years ago out of Great Valley School District, we have a 30 to 35% increase in pricing. Um, and actually, that just came from last year to this year. So that as well might be surprising to some people. Uh, I think if I may, I wanna also note, um, we took our volumes based on all the information that we had, and the information that we had was that the Universal Meals program was expiring on June 30th. Um, so those were numbers based on us assuming that we're returning back to a traditional NSLP program, and you know that's the direction it looks like we are probably headed um, right now. 
Anyone else? Jeff. Kristen, thank you so much. I just want to make sure I understand the 105% rule. Yeah. It makes sense to me to get apples to apples, no pun intended, for mm -hmm. the, the bid prices. Right. But if there's um, an item where you apply the 105% rule, does that mean that item is then not available within the bid ultimately from the vendor? And if so, did that give you any cause for concern with the winning bidder? Sure, let me clarify. Uh, so the answer to that question is no. If there was no response, we remove that item. What this does is it would assume that there was a response. So it equates the, the three responses so that it, it is even. Um, if there were, regarding the 105% rule in um, the final submission and the contract that we'll enter into, the answer is yes. So with that being said, we utilize the 105% rule for an evaluation tactic. However, ultimately, if US Foods was um, entered um, a SKU with and we had to utilize the 105% rule, we would accept that they did not, and they will not provide that item. I will note that we had a 95% submission standard. So we accept that being on, that all everybody, you know, had submitted 95% of the SKUs. So yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Art? Two, two questions. Okay. Uh, one is, any concerns regarding the uh, availability uh, and the costs? Are they, are they committed to get everything? I know how much wheat has increased over <laughs> yeah. the past three weeks. Uh, supply chain, uh, do they have to deliver what they promise to deliver? We have extent, um, so the short answer is they're only responsible for delivering what they can get into their building. And there's plenty of force majeure. We have act of God clauses. We have so many uh, SKUs that are being removed from production to streamline other manufacturing um, initiatives. So they can only produce what they can produce. And they are absolutely, so th this reward is a, or this award is a prime, vent, prime distributor um, award. So the anticipation, or we anticipate that they're going to provide as much as they can. When they can't, I've written language in our contract of the information that they're supposed to furnish so that meets all the PDE guidelines for procurement, um, et cetera, so that we can establish why they're not giving us those items. And I've also written into the contract substitution clauses so that we have an attempt to keep our menu cycles, our nutritionals, et cetera, as even as possible. That answer that question. Also, we, we know that the federal government is, as you indicated, stopping the uh, free meals uh, yeah. at the end of June. I I'm curious, maybe at another meeting we can talk about the implication of that uh, in Upper Dublin and also on your budget. So I know, you know, and, and, and what are our plans for uh, the summer and, and September when we go into... Uh, I guess people will be paying for the meals again. Yeah, I'd be happy to talk about that. I would just note that um, I just got back from DC last weekend. I met with Senator Casey. I met with four other representatives. I'm now supporting. So, it, you know, at the terms of this conference, essentially the uh, omnibus omnibus did not include the congressional authority to extend the waivers. And so we were shuffling, you know, strategizing, et cetera. And right now we're really just, I'm speaking with um, Fitzpatrick and some other representatives to really support 6613. And there's a big indication for that, but I, um, I'm prepared for either. I'm hopeful, but I, I, you know, I don't think I've made, you know, there's no qualms about the fact that I want uh, free meals for all students, all children, period. Um, but I have to kind of align with what the reg is, and I'm prepared to do either. And I'm, again, happy to talk about that and what the sure. implications are. Sure, so I think it's something that, that the district and, and, and school boards need to look at. It's, uh, it's, it's not a done deal yet. Right. It, you know, and, and to advocate as much as we can Absolutely. for... Uh, and I will say that um, our district and this RFP is really being looked at 
because we're one of the first RFPs to gain a response. And so I've met with Vonda Cook, who, Vonda Ramp, excuse me, um, who is the agency director at PDA, kind of discussing what this means and the implications for all school districts. Um, and what you said about we earlier makes a, a lot of sense and we will be affected by that. However, um, I think one advantage we have is that we went out so early, we went out earlier than a lot of other um, cooperatives. And so before there was a fertilizer shortage and before there was you know, issues with wheat and other crops, we got locked in pricing for manufacturers. Of course, there's de-escalation and escalation clauses that we have to honor, but they're really gonna have to adhere to um, defining why and using the CPI and PPI to do so. That does sound like a worthwhile topic for a future meeting um, to talk about, especially the implications on the food service budget, sure uh, which while we, you know, is not like our general fund, it's a, a self-funded uh, budget. It's important that, that uh, the board has an understanding of that. Am I correct that we set the prices? Do we have to set the prices for the meals before September then? Yes. Right, yes. the new pricing? Yeah, so our prices are set, but if there's any changes to our price after I perform a paid lunch equity study, then I would appeal to the board um, to make those adjustments. Anyone else? All right, thanks very much, Kristen. Thank you so much. Next up, we have a Sandy Run update. I see Zach and Arif are here. I see Zach standing up, so let me imagine Zach will be providing this month's update. Good evening, uh, Zach with Dewey Engineering. I see a few new board members. I've been the um, construction manager on site since the new uh, middle school project began in uh, 2019. So I haven't been here and given you guys an update on, since November. So we will move right into the next slide, folks, please. So a lot has happened since then. Uh, this site phasing plan, you can see we are almost at the end of it. And what has happened since I was here last, the roofing, the first bullet point has totally been complete. Um, the building is watertight. The biggest point here is the site work that we're getting into this summer. Um, is there's a lot that's going to happen in the summertime after the actual building gets turned over. Um, in order to get occupancy for August. Uh, there's a lot of site work that needs to happen, parking lots, handicap, uh, ramps, e emergency egresses, items like that. As far as the building construction goes, it is in very good shape. And we're mostly at this point working on flooring finishes, a little bit of ceiling finishes, and uh, just to install the seating in the planetarium. The bleachers are already on site. The wood floor has been going in today. So as far as the building, very good. On to the next slide, show you a couple of milestone dates. Uh, we have met all the milestone dates for the site work so far. And now that we are back into spring weather, the site work has already started in anticipation of the amount of work that we need to complete um, for August. So you can see we've completed the tasks um, on time and a number of those items that weren't supposed to start until summer we've already trying to get a jump on them because there's just a lot of work to do in the summer next slide please uh, this one slide is showing mostly the building construction itself and as I stated earlier um, that's in very good shape we're doing flooring finishes um, and just waiting on some seating. So we, the contractors have been working very diligently to hit all these milestone dates. Date. So I'm gonna show you some pictures as to what's going on. Those were the latest drone shots of the outside of the building. Um, we can move on to the next slide. We'll show you some interior stuff. Uh, the boilers were now have been operational all winter long. So that was a good thing um, to be able to get finishes to, to continue. And in that right picture, you see that tag there, that was done by the, that's part of the um, in inspections. There's a number of things that we need to obtain for the certificate of occupancy. So in this case, the, the boilers or any pressure, pressure vessels <laughs> have to be registered with the state of Pennsylvania. So that's just one of the number of items we see that's already been completed. Next slide, please. 
Again, a few more pictures of the mechanical room. Those are the pumps on the left-hand side and all that big white stuff you see, that's all the installations already completed, so those will get labeled. And on the right-hand picture shows the installation of the water softener and brine tank. All of the items in the mechanical room um, are fully operational. Uh, the chiller, which makes the cold water for air conditioning, that's already been placed on the roof. That's gonna, we're gonna start that up in just a few weeks. Thank you. The MDF closet, that is the, where the systems all talk to themselves. Uh, we have the uh, Crown Castle, who was the internet provider for this area, did run the fiber optic. A few weeks ago, the contractors installed the data rack, and just as of today, the district was in there installing the network switch, so as of this afternoon, the new Sandy Run Middle School has the ability not only to talk to the existing middle school, but also the outside world, which is absolutely crucial in identifying the building automation systems, um, all of the point to point, because there's so much that goes into the mechanical systems now with the lighting controls, so that would, that's a very big milestone that we achieved just today. Just a few pictures of some areas. Um, that's the music suite. You can see the, what those wood acoustic panels are across the top. Those are uh, sound baffles. There's insulation behind them. Those have been installed. You can see lower um, all the instrument storage racks. And that, it, like, things are changing out there daily at this point since we have a few months to finish. So just since those pictures were taken, um, all, of the, all of the covers have since been put on the instrument racks and the above ceiling inspection has been completed. A few more pictures, principal's office, the carpeting's been installed, um, the cabinetry sinks in, in the nurse's suite. So I'm just trying to show the different areas there and, and where we are with progress. All right, thank you, Brooke. The auditorium, the sound baffles on the left-hand side, you can see the contractors installing those. Those have since been completed since this since these pictures have been taken. And you can tell from the right-hand side picture that the auditorium, uh, the lights have been in, the diffusers are in the ceiling, the final painting's been done. So that lift you see in there is actually going to be moved out at the end of this week um, in preparation to get the floors and the seating completed. Uh, the toilet room finishes in progress. The reason I took this picture is because we've got the sinks, the mirrors, the um, towel dispensers, all those need to be at a specific height for ADA regulations. So we like to get that stuff installed early, have it inspected by code enforcement and the township, just to make sure if we need to change anything, we have ample time to do it before seeking occupancy. That's the gym flooring going down. You can see on the left and on, on the right-hand side much more of it. And that's the what they call the sleepers. That's the wood floor underneath of the actual uh, sports flooring that gets installed. And in, since this picture has been taken, they've probably installed about 25% of the actual wood, the sports wood flooring. So we're moving right along. Um, I know there's a lot going on in these two pictures, but this is the serving area and the kitchen installation, the, the uh, kitchen equipment. Uh, we've had that, on th that material on site for quite some time due to COVID and uh, supply chain issue concerns. We couldn't install it until the flooring and the finishes around it were complete and the, uh, the above ceiling work was complete. So all of those pieces have fallen together and now the, uh, the kitchen equipment and serving area. And there's a lot of work here because this involves not only the kitchen, contractor, but everything from the HVAC contractor, the plumber for the steamers, um, the drains, the, the general contractor, the electricians to power the equipment and the different phases. So there's a lot going on there and uh, so far moving along quite well. The planetarium's been completed on the outside and I know the picture on the right's a little tough to visualize, but that's the dome. You see a white screen in front, and there's a curtain over to the over to the right-hand side, so they can not only project things on the screen itself, but when they're using the the dome, they can pull that curtain over so they don't see the screen. But that white dome that you see in the top of the picture, that's all been completed as of last week. All of the stage rigging 
in the, for the auditorium stage, that's all been completed. The screen's been installed, you can see on the left. On, on the right-hand side, you can see um, that the curtains, the curtains look a little funny because they're tied up. We put bags on the bottom of them just to keep the dust and stuff off them. So um, the auditorium is ready for seating. And just a few pictures of the outside. Um, if you looked at your monthly report, you didn't have the Sandy Run Middle School spelled out yet. Um, so I wanted to get that picture in here just to show you that how fast things are changing out there. Um, corridors, you can see those are complete. Ceilings have been in. And the cleaning crews have been there for the last two weeks. So uh, the third floor is just about completely cleaned. And um, I said ready for installations. The top left picture there, you can see that's the 70-inch monitors that go into all of the classrooms. So what the district has done is procured that material early. They've delivered those to each of the classrooms. Um, so we met with the IT department on several occasions to determine what's going to work best for the district. So we have the general contractor installing the bracket. The electrical contractor is coming in, putting all the cables together and actually hanging the monitor. So the district's ID, IT department, all they have to do is plug in three cords, put their PC behind the monitor, and they're ready to go. See the finishes in the rest of the classrooms are just about complete. Uh, family consumer science, um, all the equipment's been procured. You can see the microwaves, the dishwashers, those are getting ready to, to be pushed into place. Um, that's the library. So we wanted to get moving on that quite early. We again procured the furniture and the racks early enough that we had to store them in order to get, again, above ceiling finished and the carpeting in there. But as you can see, that space is ready for checkout. One more drone shot of the entire building there, as you can see. And then I'll turn it over to Arif for the next few slides. Uh, good evening, board. So just wanted to uh, tie up a couple of loose ends. First of all, doesn't he look good when he dresses up. Have you guys ever seen him like this? He seems to be doing better and better every time, so I'm kind of nervous about that because we have more projects coming up, but anyway. Arif, if you want, just pull the mic out and hand yeah. it. Okay, thank you. All right, there you go. Thanks. Anyway, so the lead scorecard, I just wanted to make sure we were keeping track of that and we're doing really well with that. This project was one of the last projects that got the LEED ACE grant, about a million three, and we've put that to really good use on this project. Uh, in fact, on the budget line items for that, we're doing really well as well and are under tracking under budget on that. Speaking about budget, um, Zach had all the good stuff on quality and schedule. If you go to the next slide, Brooke. Thank you. Is the budget, we're of course managing the budget continuously with the Andy and um, we are tracking uh, under budget as planned. And uh, one of the things I just wanted to point out is the contingency that's noted there is an old line item. We've just gone through some reconciliation with Andy and that number is uh, tracking still in good shape but closer to a million, 1.1 million. So that's where we are with that. But all of the other line items on the budget are tracking really well. We've managed the project through COVID. I think that's an important thing to keep in the back of our minds and have come out well ahead on schedule and under budget. So we've done a great job with that. So a couple items we're looking at in phase three, as Zach mentioned, phase three is heavy, heavy site work. And uh, there's a couple items in phase three that we're, we're managing, and I think uh, most of you are aware of it. We're looking at the retaining wall. We're looking at the, um, the fill that has to be removed from the site and we're also monitoring some issues with pipe uh, pricing. So those are the three things we're tracking. Other than that, we're in really good shape um, on most of the other cost items. So, so just want to end with this slide and just you know tell us uh, tell you that um, you know the building is scheduled and ready for occupancy in August of 2022. We don't see any issues with the building. Um, as Zach noted, we're hoping for some cooperative weather for the summer work.
because that's going to be big if we lose a lot a lot of days there and we don't want any of the type of storms we've just experienced of course but uh, we're working on the HVAC parameters and systems Bob's team and everyone has been very very active in all of that uh, we've been looking at training schedules for owner training in the various systems and uh, security and all of those important emergency systems, getting those well commissioned and operational. Uh, furniture and technology, Zach pointed out to a couple of those, but that's been heavy work there. There's a lot, lot going on and Andy and everybody's been involved in that, um, the principals and all of the staff. So that's been very, very well. And then we're working very well with all of the agencies that have to give us the final approvals for occupancy the township in particular, but there's some other outside agencies as well that Zach mentioned. And so right now we're really looking forward to everybody celebrating the occupancy of, uh, of the school and uh, jumping over to phase three of the project. So we still got some to do, but uh, we're looking really good. And um, I think on this next slide, there was a question Andy had mentioned to me. Um, I just want to point out, and I can just do it, Zach, if you if you want. But to the rear, by the 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 music area, on the back side of the building, we did have a little bit of storm damage from the last storm, and that was really a function of the fact that the grading in the back there wasn't completely complete. As Zach said, the building is watertight, but we did get some water coming in at the door entrances in the back there. And that was cleaned up uh, promptly. Everything has been taken care of, but that, that was what the issue was there. I know there, was, there might have been a question about that. But other than that, that's our presentation, Andy. All right, thank you both. Uh, I'll just note also in the agenda, you, you see the regular February update um, in, the, in the usual format, which I think is basically superseded by the presentation that Zach gave us, which is more up to date. Uh, any questions or comments for the team from Dewey? Thank you. It's great to see this um, coming coming to uh, fruition, and it's very exciting to 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 see the building where it is now and all the progress, even in the last two weeks that were made. Um, I have two questions. One, um, you showed the acoustic or the acoustic materials in both the music and in the auditorium. Is there at any point, is there some point in the process uh, where you're actually doing some testing if the acoustics are what you want them to be? Is that done already or is that just, yeah, where is that? So that's a really good question. Um, it's done from a modeling standpoint because this is a lead project. So there was an acoustical consultant. But if you're asking is there some field acoustical testing done as part of the requirements, no. Uh, the HVAC is certainly tested, all of the other systems, but there's no acoustical test. So it's really done based on the modeling and the materials are approved and reviewed by the architect, the acoustic engineer, and they're placed where they're supposed to be. So um, I think there are some very, very high tech facilities where that is done, but this is not a, a requirement of this project. No, that, I, that's what I kind of assumed, but I was right. curious, especially as that is a sort of recent addition to, in, the, in the building. I mean, the panels and the... It's recent, but as designed. Yes. It's just yeah. No. 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 Final yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, the other question I have is related to the lead scorecard um, of the remaining item or the things that are not filled in yet. Yeah. Uh, what is the timeline on that, and uh, do you expect the numbers to come out the way they were originally projected? Yeah, we're very comfortable. We've looked at that as um, there are two phases of submission. One is the end of design, uh, start of construction, and we basically hit all those points. We have the targeted points for construction, which are much less, but we're tracking them. You cannot submit them until the entire project is complete. And, and that means including phase, phase three, three, right? Yeah, all of it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Just thanks for that clarification. Yeah. Great. Thank you. But uh, in terms of the funds, Andy would be happy to report the district has received all of the ACE grant funds at this point, so. Mike, did you have something? Yes, 
Hey, Mike, just hold on, hold on one second. We're going to try to rig up a mic so that the. Okay, thank you. All right, Mike, go ahead. Thank you. I think we've done a nice job quantifying the uh, savings opportunities at 3.1 million. Um, have we been able to uh, quantify or even provide a best estimate on the budget uh, risk areas? I know we identified for the fill placement, fire, the power for uh, asbestos basement during demolition, existing building demolitions, and uh, the uh, parking. I think one of those four uh, we actually are, are, are looking at uh, contracting out today, reviewing that uh, later on in the agenda, it, I believe it's $28,000, but do we have a feel for the, the, the size of the risk that we're looking at budget-wise? So that's a good opportunity for me to toss it to, there is a third item in the in this uh, item in the agenda, which is the regular San Juan budget item. Andy, do you want to? Anything to talk about in there, or can you answer Mike's question? I, yeah, I, I think it's more. So, so the items that you mentioned on the slide prior to this, where you said the items we're still working on, I think yep. that's primarily what what Mike's asking about is the large risk areas. Um, the fill issue, I think, is one of the big ones that yep. we're working on. So, I, those are the areas that he's talking about. The parking that we're looking about getting done. So, do we have order any I order of magnitude on those at this point? Uh, yeah, the three, the, the retaining wall one, I think a memorandum has been sent to the board with that information. So I think that is pretty much there. Um, on the fill issue, we did have a budget line item, but it's really hard. We have a budget line item for the fill, but we're expecting that budget line item potentially to not be adequate. But we're still working on that, and I think it's best if we don't actually put out any number on that because we're still working through that, Andy, if you would agree. Um, so I think we're better off uh, with the, just the information that's on the budget line item for that. And then the, sorry, the it's right right now in the budget, it's 150,000. We have as a line item for it, that's included in the budget. Uh, and then the other item was the parking. It's kind of related to the fill, but the parking is really a risk thing. It's not a cost so much. We're looking at possibly expending a little bit of overtime costs but, uh, to make sure that we meet that deadline, but a lot is gonna depend on the weather and the movement of the fill. So it's hard to put a number on that, but the overtime will not be a heavy number we just got to make sure we get some cooperative weather, like I said, and uh, hopefully things go in our way. And uh, the goal is to get as much parking as possible for the teachers prior to start a school and maybe work some weekends and, and nights to make sure that that happens. So it's hard to put a number on that. But those are the big three that we're tracking and uh, we feel like um, you know, we have some allocation for it, but um, need to just, as we said, manage it and be careful. Area right now, uh, from a schedule perspective, is the is weather for the uh, parking? It's the weather, but also hopefully we don't, we have um, included in the scope the removal of the, the existing building sits on deep foundations, they're caissons essentially, so we included in the scope the removal of them, that is included, so that will not be an unknown, unknown, but there could be other variables when we tear the building down. And, and that's why we're keeping track of our contingency carefully. Um, I think we have a pretty good handle on the asbestos. I think you manage, mentioned that. That is included in the scope and we have a pretty good handle on that. So um, I think we should be in good shape. Uh, we're keeping our fingers crossed, but underground is always the issue. And the board will remember, I think I made a comment, something to the effect at the last meeting, the last finance meeting, that I won't be breathing easy until we have the existing building down because one never knows what we might find. So um, as a reset and as Andy will reiterate, we'll watch the contingency very, very closely um, for that. Very good. Thank you. All right, who's in charge of weather? Uh, isn't that you, Mr. Sirota? I'll see what I can do. <laughs> uh, all right, any, anything else for the Dewey team? Okay. Do we have a contingency in mind yet? I know it's still a little early for the parking in case we can't get it done in time. Obviously the teachers need a place to park. <laughs> for the parking, your yeah. question was? Yeah. 
Um, as as far as a contingency fund, or your your question was a about plan, a fund, yeah, a yeah. contingency plan. Yeah, where would they park? <laughs> what would we do? We do. We we've looked at other sites uh, across the street at the. Uh, the Twining Corporate Center building. Uh, the back half of that building is a township park. Uh, we've talked to the township. They would allow us to use up to 48 spots uh, that they have in the rear. Uh, we also confirmed that there would be nothing preventing us from parking along the street. Um, you know, Audubon, Martin, if we needed to. That was the last, uh, last resort contingency that we don't expect, but it was everything that we looked at. Um, we also looked at the shopping center across the street. Uh, they were not interested in allowing us to park there. And when we took a poll of the number of spots that we need, Bob, correct me if I'm wrong, it's about 100 spots that we would need on a daily basis, correct? Yes, uh, between teachers, staff, we're, we're right around 100. So if we had to use that park uh, in the back there, that would handle about half of that, half of that. That park. would handle half of that. Um, we talked, uh, uh, Zach, uh, we, the parts that we know are gonna get done in the back. We do have some parking in the rear of the building by the cafeteria. Uh, there's also a basketball court that gets put in that'll be done this summer. Uh, we could park cars on there as well. I think we could get 20, 30 spots in, in the rear of the building. And obviously, as Bob said, the last thing we wanna do is park in the neighborhood. So that will really be the, the choice of last resort. Anybody else? Art. Zach. Uh, 528.23, uh, prepare grade at new multi-purpose softball and baseball fields, finish grade and install field improvements uh, by May, by sometime in May. Will those fields actually be done? No, the fields will not be, that's a, that was a start date. Okay. Um, the, you, you will have the multi-purpose field, which now is where the trailers were stored yep. before. That you'll have, and some of the surrounding areas. The reason we hit that date was to get the trailers out of there so that the site work could begin. We're gonna start around the loading dock area and work our way down. And we have to do that in certain phases. Montgomery County Conservation District has to get involved with that to make sure there's substantial growth and, and uh, items like that. But we are moving well in that, in that direction to get right. the multi-purpose field complete. But you're talking, about grass on there, right. so not sure how, but how much, so, a, so a lot of those, you did take the alternate facade, but I don't right. think you're gonna be using those fields in 2022 start of school. That's that's yeah. the question, yeah, I didn't think we we were, were we sodding the multi-purpose field? I don't, uh, you did I, take the alternate to sod that field, yes. That field, and, okay. Yep. Okay, I would, and then. I would still would still give it a little time to take before we get on it. We'd have to monitor that before we get on it. Right, oh yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And it'll, we've been, it'll look ready, but we should be careful. We've been clear, Dr. Levinowitz, with um, our internal sports teams and outside groups that we won't be using that field in the fall. That field, uh, we would be foolish to use that field in the fall. It would create damage and would take the field offline uh, in the future for more time than it would be if we just let it rest uh, and let the sod take root, right? Yep. Yeah, I, I think we just have to ensure that the community is aware of the, the building is done, but but so much is not done in terms of what the community will take advantage of. I mean, I know UDJA is, is really anxious to get into those, uh, into the gyms and, and use it, I mean, but we have to look at where they would park and if the parking would be available for them and if we have any theater productions in the in the auditorium you know would we be able to park a, a full house uh, in the evening in, in in the in in the auditorium so it's it will be uh you know there, there will be some parking those are all things too that we'll be working with dr ortiz on a communication plan as we go throughout the year and no doubt there's going to be pressure for people to be on those fields before they're ready and in the gyms before they're ready, but the answer is a hard no, because we put money into this investment and we don't wanna do things too early that wind up diminishing that investment. Anyone else? Just one last question, a Andy, for Andy. Uh, furniture and equipment, F&E, <laughs> 1.8 million, we've spent 
I think we've expended like 250. Uh, when is the rest, when is the furniture coming in? When will we see a significant amount expended? And will we be at that 1.8 or more? So we, so we just ha had an email this morning about the delivery date. So we're looking at the beginning of July to, for everything to be installed in the building. Um, I do expect to be right around that 1.8 million, if not slightly over that. So, so that's when we should expect to see that, that expended. I remember in the budget, Dr. Yanni, we, we increased that by... We had to, because million, the, yeah. we, we had to. We had to take a million out of the contingency, contingency yeah. because the, the initial uh, line item for uh, furniture and equipment was 800,000. Yeah. Right. And furniture and equipment contains not just the furniture that kids are going to sit in, but all of the technology that goes with it. So um, I think that um, Mr. Lechman, working with Dr. Ortiz and the middle school team, and also our teaching and learning office did a nice job of making sure that we have the right furniture, the appropriate furniture, uh, but making sure that we were, we were um, that we didn't cheap, go cheap on anything, but we are probably will be right over that 1.8 million. Yeah, so, so you did work with the Corbett Center at, to some degree in terms of coming up with what's most appropriate for us? Well, okay, so I'm gonna be honest with you. When you go to the Corbett Center and you buy I know. Their stuff is really, really expensive. So we <laughs> looked at the Corbett Center and then bought comparable things. Um, Correct. But we worked with Breslin um, on some designs, and I'll let uh, Mr. Luckman expand yeah, on that. I, I, that was part of the process, right? We, we hired Breslin. They, they did some work for us. I believe we brought that proposal back to back to this committee to discuss it. So we, had, we went through a proposal process. There were two very um, competitive proposals that were submitted, and we, we chose the lowest bid, so... You feel, Andy, you feel good that furniture will come in on, on time, considering what's going on in the world? We, we have no reason to believe that it won't. So yes, we've been, we've been assured that we'll have it on time. Thank you. And that's part of the reason why we selected the furniture so early. In other projects that we've done right now, we would be selecting the furniture. We did the furniture months and months ago. Anyone else? Anything else to talk about on the budget? Uh, for the Sandy Run, from you or from from the committee? I don't have anything. I, the budget hasn't changed much from last month, and we heard an update tonight. So certainly open to questions. Okay. Thank you both. I would just like to thank, uh, in particular, Zach. Every time we're over at the the building, he inevitably finds us and is always available uh, to walk us through any questions or concerns that we have. So, Zach, thank you so much. You. Have a good evening. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Next up, we have uh, item C, the um, proposal from Element Environmental for the demolition of the main building. Uh, Mr. Lester's, Mr. Lester is going to cover this. I do just want to note because I think Mr. Henderson brought it up is that this is this doesn't have anything to do with the the risk area that we noted on the budget. This is a planned part of the project here. So, Mr. Lester. Uh, yes, uh, Element Environmental is the company that we use to help us monitor uh, asbestos jobs, help us stay in compliance. They do the air sampling, the testing. Uh, they give the all clear after everything is finished. Uh, so the actual asbestos abatement is Sargent Enterprises. Their contract um, was part of the initial bit of the building. So the removal of the asbestos is, is covered. Uh, this is our part. This is our oversight of the job that's happening to make sure that we are staying in compliance. Any questions? So is, it, is part of the budget? The cost for this? This is this part is of part, the budget, yes. Part of the construction budget? Correct. Correct. Right. Okay. Yeah, because I'm not It wasn't part of the bid, but it's part of the budget, to clarify. Right. Right. Yeah, okay. Right. We, we anticipated this cost. And yes. Yep. Correct. There's, there right. is a line item in the budget, in the budget for budget. this work. Right. Yes. In addition to Sergeant. So. Correct. Right. Did, you, did you have something? Okay. Anybody else? All right. So, um, Members of the committee will move this forward to the legislative meeting. Yes. And while I'm asking that question, uh, I neglected to ask that for item A, the food service RFP uh, that Kristen presented to us earlier. Are we prepared to move that one forward to the legislative meeting? Yes. Okay, thank you. And my apologies for the uh, omission. 
Uh, we are going to jump ahead in the agenda because Prakash has something else um, he needs to do later. So we're going to jump ahead to items M and N. Um, the renewal for instant IQ and a new Chromebook lease. Go ahead, Prakash. Thank you. Um, so last year we adopted um, Incident IQ to be our database for user devices. Um, Incident IQ has allowed us to capture information about the physical device as well as the um, cross uh, connect to the device, uh, to the user, the location, um, tech tickets associated uh, with the device. And so we spent the summertime uh, setting up tech reps and librarians in each of our buildings uh, to be able to process Chromebook loaners, um, to submit tickets on behalf of our users, and that has worked out really well for us. Um, uh, they uh, they help with the um, the uh, sorry I'm drawing a blank. <laughs> they helped us with um, the workflow that was designed to process Chromebooks and and our um, tech tickets, and so. Uh, this has helped the, the tech department tremendously in identifying our tech needs and being able to capture information related to uh, the support of the technology. So for example, when a student comes in to the library for a Chromebook repair, we can pull up their entire history and see what other tickets um, was created for that student and if those tickets have been closed, uh, who worked on those tickets, um, the devices that they were logging into. So we collect a lot of metadata and that helps us tremendously when a student comes in uh, with uh, with the need for support. And same for our staff, when they go to the library for that support, we can pull that information. And so it really helps the librarians who are supporting our users to have a full picture of what they're looking at um, when they're providing support. Um, our next step is to train all staff members to, to um, allow them to create their own tickets, and this is gonna cut down on our support time. Uh, right now they go to the librarians or our, our tech reps who then put the ticket on their behalf. Um, we're gonna take the workflow that we designed for our tech reps and replicate it for our, all of our users. So all of our users will be able to submit their own ticket and that's gonna cut down on the support time and get them the, the support that they need um, as quickly as possible. Um, one thing you'll notice in the contract, it does say for 14 months and the reason for that is because um, just like my other uh, vendor contracts for tech, uh, we'd like them to start in ju on July 1st and then on June 30th, so the additional two months will allow us to put those contracts in line with the other tech contracts that we have. So there are for, this particular contract is for 14 months. All right, I'll take any questions you have at this time. Questions? Titia? So the fact that you're bringing this back means that you're very satisfied with the product and, and, and uh, the cost you feel is worth we are. Yes. We are. No. The, the ease of use is, is tremendous, and that helps us um, to get people to put in that data so that we can make sound decisions as well. And we can also look at trends that are happening with our devices as well. Are there any things that you've picked up already this year that you would otherwise not have known about? Um, we're, we are seeing um, a, a lot of support needed for inside a classroom. So when, when teachers report Wi-Fi issues, we're able to take that single instance and also look into the other buildings as well. Um, so that's one of the things that we've been able to do um, and, and that has helped uh, do some preventive things to ensure that we don't get the same type of tickets in. That's great, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, just quick question, is this a item already in the budget or is this a budget add-on? It, it, it's already included in the budget. Okay, great. Rakash, does this replace track it or supplement it? Um, so track it has a different use. Um, what track it allows us to do, well, we were using it as a ticketing system, but it was very limited. Uh, most importantly, we can only have certain number of users submit ticket. Um, but the other piece to track it um, that, that um, we use for is to, to support Windows systems um, without having to go to uh, go to the site to provide that support. So from remote, we can figure we can uh, figure out the, the operating system, the software that is on that, um, the age of the device, and so forth. So we use Trackit to provide support for Windows systems, and we have a lot of Windows systems still that need support. Uh, the, uh, Instant IQ, unfortunately, don't allow some of those features. It's more for um, just managing the asset and associating tickets to those um, assets. Okay. Any, anyone else? All right, so we'll move that one forward. Yes, okay, thank you. Um, and uh, the Chromebook lease. Okay. Um, so we're looking to lease um, Acer Chromebooks again for our rising fifth, eighth, and 11th graders. Um, 
We followed the same uh, procedure as we did when we identified the Chromebooks for last year, which is looking at Google for recommendations for specs that would meet um, usage for uh, online learning as well as in person. And I want to be very, very mindful in making sure that we identify devices that's going to support us on both ends. And so if you ever needed to pivot, we, we have devices that would allow us to support um, both learning environments. Um, these Chromebooks will also come with a case, a uh, three-year warranty, um, and they'll have white glove services as well, which means that they'll come enrolled into our Google platform, uh, so we don't have to do any enrolling on our end. The vendor will provide that for us. Um, and then uh, they'll also have asset tags on there, so it'll come labeled with the student's information, uh, the building they're in, um, and there'll be a, a, a QR code, which will then be used to scan into Instant IQ whenever uh, there is a need to provide support. So they'll come ready to use. So uh, during the summertime when we do the deployment, we literally just have to give the box to the students and that's all we need to do, so we're hands off. So, um, questions regarding Chromebook release? Uh, this, and they're basically the same. They are, so it's, it's actually the next model up from this one. Um, this model uh, is no longer in production. Um, so we got the next model. So I stayed with Acer only because uh, the experience that we've had has been um, uh, very positive. Um, it's meeting our students' need uh, and as well as our teachers. Anyone else? Jeff. For gosh, Andy, this may sound stupid, but before we sign the lease proposal, can you just double check? I think it says there's a monthly payment of 160,000 as opposed to annual. <laughs> so so that, that's, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. I have that in my notes. I was gonna mention that is, um, it, the payment frequency says annual, but it says monthly payment. We already have that addressed. That's corrected for the, the board agenda on Monday night. Good, good point, thank you. Stole one of mine, Jeff. Um, <laughs> my other question, same one I asked before. Was this, this is already in the budget as well? Yep. Okay. Can I just make one one comment on that? So once we, um, and this is really just kind of for everyone's review, once we talk about our preliminary budget, anything that we bring forth for the remainder of the year is always inside the budget. If, it, if there's something that we need to add um, to the budget at this point, we will actually do a presentation as to why that needs to go to go into the budget. So um, one of the things that we like about Mr. Lechman is uh, he reminds us often that uh, we're building needs-based budgets. So don't change based on <laughs> <laughs> unless the need changes. <laughs> and I, the, that's a fair statement. And I would add on to that is in, in all these areas, especially technology, we're looking at multi-year plans. So like we under, like working with Prakash, we know five years out kind of what our refresh cycle looks like. And that's part of our planning process. So, so the next lease will be comparable to this one. And the year after that will be a much bigger quantity of Chromebooks because our staff will be part of that. And then we'll repeat the cycle again. So you'll see the same trends over that three-year period cycle. Just to clarify, is this um, this year's or next year's budget we're looking at for this one? This is next year's budget. Right, so we okay. would be taking these in in the July, right at July, the beginning of July time, time frame. Yeah, yeah. yeah just a practical question. You um, Are you foreseeing any delay in these the arrival of these, or is this now that you put down this lease, it's guaranteed that we'll have so right now, the projected date uh, or time is June, um, and, and that's all we have, it is a June date. Um, if it gets pushed up, we do have a buffer of July, but definitely by August, we should have those in our hands. So right now, they're telling me June. Because I remember last year, mm -hmm. the handing out of the Chromebooks was right. spectacular. I mean, I, I think it was really, really well done, and um, it sounds like you're using the same system, so that's, I mean, I, I think that's impressive, but I, yeah, I mean, with all the supply chain so issues, this year, are you concerned about that timing? Yeah, so this year, um, I'm also putting this in motion in advance compared to last year. Um, so I, that's I also that, gonna yeah. give us, yeah, that's also <laughs> gonna help us yeah. with the timeline. Okay, great, thanks. We also have an army of people that we can reach out to to make sure that Upper Dublin gets prioritized. And uh, <laughs> just like we don't want to cross Mr. Lechman on the budget, um, I've heard Mr. Patel on the call on calls with customer service sometimes, and it's amazing how quickly he can get devices in the district. I try. I try. Anyone else? Excellent. All right. So members of the committee will move this forward. Yes. 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 Okay. Thank you, Prakash. Thank you.
to go back up in the agenda to item D, uh, a big one, the ESCO selection recommendation. Yes, thank you. So at the January Finance Committee meeting, um, you remember that ICS presented on the work required to restore the Fort Washington Elementary School um, after the significant, significant storm damage that we um, that occurred there. Um, the recommendation was to not only consider the insurance claim restoration process, but also consider necessary work identified um, that they identified through their facility condition assessment. Um, they, they recommended, and the administration certainly supports that, is it's prudent to consider that while the building is in the renovation process, right, ceilings down, walls open, that we look at um, additional work that's required since that building hasn't had a major upgrade in almost 30 years. So in that presentation, ICS recommended using the Guaranteed Energy Savings Act, so the GISA model, um, for more flexibility as it is a design build model versus the typical design bid build model. Um, and the reason they recommended that was because it provides more flexibility, we can move faster, um, and it still um, gets the district where it needs to be from a, a work and a, a cost competitiveness standpoint. Um, the board supported the recommendation, so we went to work and we released, we quickly released an RFP for proposals, and we received two strong proposals from qualified ESCOs, um, energy savings companies, um, and they were CMTA and CM3. Um, and what we did, we decided to bring both of those companies in after we reviewed their proposals, um, and we had an interview process with both of them um, that included a, a small team. So two of our board members were on that team and three of our administrators were on that team. Um, so Mr. Sirota, Mr. Henderson, um, Bob Lester, Dr. Yanni and myself uh, were, sat in those interviews. Um, we thought the interviews were both extremely positive and certainly believe both of these companies could do a, a great job for us. We feel like they're both very qualified to do the work, um, but the recommendation is to move forward with CMTA. Um, and really what we, the way we looked at that was all things being equal, we believe that CMTA is the right choice because of the synergy they have with ICS, who's our construction manager. Um, and with the complexity and comple compressed timeline we're looking at in getting this project done, um, we feel strongly that providing ICS as much opportunity to um, manage this process um, lead, will lead to the success of the overall project for all of us. So if that recommendation is supported, our next step would be for CMTA to complete the investment grade audit portion of the, the GISA process. And essentially what that means is that's the design portion of the process. They would go through, evaluate the building, evaluate our systems, which a lot of that work is already done. Um, and then bring back to this committee um, a, a recommendation on the work that should be done in that building. Um, and ultimately it would be this committee and the board um, approving a final project based on the, the estimated costs and the wor their work recommendations. Um, so I wanna make sure it's clear at this point, just as ICS told us when they presented to us um, a couple of months ago was that it, it still remains a no risk process for the board. Um, so there are no costs to do the investment grade audit. Um, CMTA would do that at their risk. They would bring back a proposal and then this, um, this board would make a decision on the final work that's to be done at the building. So I'll stop there and ask if there's any questions. Sure there are some, who's got them? Mike, did, no? Go ahead, Andy, oh, let, let's let Mike go first. Yeah, go ahead, Mike. I just, thank you. I just wanted to add that uh, uh, I, while uh, I concur with what Mr. Lechman just uh, just discussed, while both <clears throat> teams had very impressive presentations, uh, for me, I felt that uh, CMTA did an outstanding job uh, clearly identifying uh, savings opportunities uh, that we could see and, and past performance savings opportunities. Uh, savings results that they have achieved in other projects that were similar to uh, what we're looking at with uh, Sandy Run. Uh, so uh, I wanted to uh, concur with uh, the recommendation. Okay, thanks, Mike. Just to clarify, we're talking about Fort Washington, not Sandy Run. I'm minor misspeak there. Andy. So when they come back with recommendations in terms of the work to be done, is that an 
an all or nothing proposition or is there some discussion in terms of you know, various levels, what can be done, what's in, what's out? It is not all or nothing. They will bring back recommendations and then the board can decide either to do some of the work, none of the work, or all of the work. So that'll be fully um, within the, the control of, of this board. Even more than that, it's, it's you know, which of these types of HVAC systems or what kind of flooring do you want to use? I mean, all, all of it will be, unfortunately, because that's a lot of decisions to make, but that we're gonna have to make a lot of them. Yeah, and, and I think we would move forward with a similar work. There'd be, a, I think there'd be a smaller committee that would meet and bring a recommendation to the, the committee, sort of like we, we've done. We'll do some of the heavy lifting behind the scenes and you'll see, the board will see all of it, but we'll, a recommendation will be brought forward. Thank you. Um, the timeline, is that still what was presented in um, January? Yeah, the, the timeline's not changed. That's, uh, that's, we're, we're moving really fast with this because we need to get this done quickly. So the timeline, we're still right on track with that proposed timeline. And, and these both are with your uh, recommendation that is with, that, that's within their scope and within their uh, ability to do that. that. That was part of the RFP and the, the presentation yeah. was December 31st is the date that it needs to be turned back over to us. And I'll add that part of their interview process, they did cover the timeline um, that they that they felt they could meet. They talked about what challenges there might be uh, involved with that timeline. Uh, and again, the part of the reason we're choosing this model is because it provides us the flexibility to dance around whatever um, challenges may be thrown at us. Jen. Um, Andy or anybody who um, interviewed this group, what can you elaborate on the synergy with ICS? Like what you mean by that? Thanks. Certainly, I, I would be happy to do that. So, um, not when we hired ICS initially as a board, but um, over the last uh, six months or so, both ICS and CMTA were acquired by the same company, um, BlackRock. So they they kind of work under the same umbrella now. Um, so while they're you know they're they're not the same company, they they certainly have kind of the same the same vision, the same goals, the same reporting structure. So and the same office building and and the same <laughs> office building. Specific to that synergy, though, because this is the first time we're doing an ESCO project. I think collectively we felt that 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 pairing uh, would benefit us because you know many times in a traditional build when you have one construction manager and one designer, you know, you're trying to manage all those pieces together. This, this synergy we think is going to work really well for us. I'll add that I, you know, I did grill them a little bit on that because it is a young relationship between these two companies. It's not like they have worked together for years and years, um, but they are clearly motivated to make their companies work well together. They demonstrated that by already starting uh, on this project hoping that they were gonna get the job. So um, they, they did an impressive amount of work up front even before the uh, proposal. So to demonstrate, I think their point was not only to get a head start on the schedule, but to demonstrate the synerg that the synergy is real. Uh, with that, I will also add that CM3, I thought um, would probably do a fine job. They're not as large a company. They don't have as broad a, a fields of expertise as CMTA does, I think we would still continue. We already do use CM3 for, for some services around the district. We would presumably continue to do that. This is not a knock against CM3, uh, but it does feel like for this particular project at this particular time, um, CMTA seemed to me to be the stronger choice. Anybody else? Okay, with that, we do not formally need um, board action on this, is that correct? I think there should be board action to move this okay. forward and, and agree to move forward with CMTA. Even though there won't be a, a, a written agreement at this point, that'll take place when we when we approve the project. Um, but I think it would be prudent for the, the Actually, board to take action. Actually, it'd be fair to them to, that we are committing to, that they move forward with this work. So, uh, so presumably it will read like it reads on this um, on this item. We will be authorizing the administration to enter into an agreement uh, are we prepared to move that forward to the legislative meeting? Yes. All right. All right. Thank you. So we'll move on. Uh, we have.
of item E, design and consulting services with ICS. Yes, and this is, this is a similar discussion. So ICS has been our, our construction manager, so we brought them on to kind of bring all of the work that's happening with the storm-related damage to consolidate it under one construction manager. Um, that The initial phase of that work with ICS ended in January when they presented to this committee around kind of their findings and the next steps forward. There was an evaluation period. Um, now what we're looking to do is, um, and, and this has always been the intent, was to continue and extend that relationship with ICS to have um, cons consultation, uh, consulting design and construction management service agreements um, to move forward with them. These would be AIA documents that we are currently working through. Um, we, we have drafts. Um, they're before our solicitor and ICS is legal to kind of work out the details. Um, but we're at a point where we need to start to move this forward so ICS can start to bill us and get paid for the, the good work that they're doing for us right now. So they're still in draft form. That's kind of why it says pending district uh, approval of district solicitor. Um, and this right now, these contracts would all be work that our insurance company is, is paying for for the work that they're doing under the, under the claim. So to clarify, we expect that to be that approval to be done by Monday night. C correct. I, okay. I would I would expect this to um, move forward on mo for Monday night to be approved, and then we would finalize the agreements with our solicitor. We can okay. certainly bring a draft of that to the to the board agenda. Yeah, I think we'd want to see the actual uh, the actual document. All right. Any uh, other comments or questions on this, Jeff? Andy, depending how the um, Giza project goes, would we also retain ICS for that? And if so, would it be under this contract with a change order, a separate contract, or am I getting way ahead of the thought process? I, I, you're on the right track. I don't have those answers yet. So I don't, I don't believe it would be under this contract. It, it's possible that it could be an addendum, but we have to work all that out. Thank you. Um, yeah, and ICS is working at the moment with the uh, township as well, right? They're familiar or not? They're familiar with with local um, issues on, or I mean, with local um, township rules and expectations in terms of all the projects. Yeah, they're, they're not working directly with the township. No. Certainly, they're collaborating with the township to, right. you know, on the permit way. processes yes. Yes. and things exactly. like that for yep. our projects. Yes, yep. absolutely else okay so we'll move uh, yeah we'll move this one forward as well okay thank you we're moving on to another big one final borrowing for SRMS yeah, so last month, uh, Melissa Hughes joined us from PFM and she gave us a, a wonderful presentation on the the market and the final borrowing for the Sandy Run construction project um, tonight I want to uh, in the uh, packet is an updated presentation that they provided. And I want to highlight a couple of points. Um, so just a reminder, from a cash flow perspective, the final borrowing does not need to occur. Um, I'm estimating around September 2022. The reason, again, that we're looking to do it now, um, I'm sure everyone saw today that the Fed raised raised rates for the first time in three years, and they also indicated that they intend to raise rates six more times. So I think we're gonna, we're gonna see increasing rates over, over the next year and a half, um, as indicated by the Fed. So I think we wanna get out ahead of this from a borrowing standpoint um, and enjoy the, the lowest rates right now. Certainly they've ticked up, but they're still at historical lows. Um, to finish the project, we estimated that we need about $4.5 million of new money um, to com complete construction, but our recommendation was to borrow $10 million to achieve um, other district capital needs like Fort Washington Elementary School and the work that we were just talking about. Um, so $10 million is the number because that's the maximum borrowing to achieve the preferred interest rate via bank qualified municipal bond. Um, so the motion specifically states this amount, um, it's just below that $10 million. I want to note that if you look at the amortization schedule for the 2022 borrowing, um, one of the things that we learned after kind of working through this with PFM um, and something they brought to our attention as well is with an ESCO project, because most of this money, um, a good portion of this money um, will likely be allocated to the work at Fort Washington and ESCO, you can't take your amortization your, or your payback schedule out beyond 20 years. 
So the original plan was a 22 year payback schedule, um, but we're only able to have 20 years and the 22 years was to achieve level, kind of the level debt service drop off um, for all of our borrowings. So what PFM did, they updated this um, to pull back two years from the, the amortization schedule. Um, what that did was it increased the payments per year for 20 years by about $50,000. Um, but I think the, the good news at the end of that is that if you look at the total cost at the bottom of that sheet, um, the total cost of that borrowing was $16.3 million. It'll now be reduced to $15.5 million because we have less of that interest accruing over the, over the 22 years. Um, so it's about an $800,000 savings for a minimal um, annual impact to the, the operating budget of about $50,000. So the recommendation remains to kind of move this forward and give them an authorization to proceed on Monday night, April 25th at the board meeting would be the approval of the maximum parameters resolution and then we would settle around the end of May. Comments or questions? Oh, okay. Um, the, the change in, in schedule uh, has us, um, ending the same year basically as the previous borrowing. Um, I just want to, you know, call everyone's attention to that, that that's not, that's, um, you know, that's just a result of the 20 year figure, not, not a deliberate, you know, scheduling thing. Uh, any, any, anyone else have anything? All right. Does the, the time change in the years, does it have any impact on our ratings, uh, Moody or otherwise? Mm. And, right? No, I, I don't expect it to. Um, again, we'll start that, we'll go through the ratings process probably in, in an end of March time, or the, the middle of April time frame. So I don't expect there to be any, any negative impact as a result of that change. Anyone else? Okay, so we'll move this forward to the legislative meeting. Yeah. All right, thank you. Next up, we have our disposal of excess obsolete and non-repairable equipment that we see most months. Uh, just a couple of items in here, any questions? Okay, we'll move that forward. Yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, anything to call our attention to in the monthly financials? Um, the only thing to call attention to is um, EI, the EIT charts, which are on um, page 66, I think it is. Um, there, there's a significant reduction as compared to last year, um, but I point that out because if you remember last year, we talked about there was a, a, a one-time um, taxpayer, one taxpayer bonus that paid out that created, that was our largest month of earned income tax. Um, revenue in any month. So the trend still is, is intact, but it looks like a reduction from prior year and that's why. And the other thing I'll mention is under transfer tax, um, there was a large transaction that occurred this month and it occurred for the first time and we're still working through it. So it, it after working with the county, it appears that there was a duplicate transaction on a large property transaction. So we do expect that we have about $50,000 too much that we received. Uh, that will need to be refunded at some point. Um, we've never seen this happen before, so we're still working through it with the county. It was nothing that we did, it was duplicate paperwork that the property owner submitted. Um, so just to note that that probably looks 50,000 higher and in some future month it'll be reversed. It'll be, that that blue bar will be $50,000 shorter or you'll we'll see a, a reimbursement in some future month. Yeah, we'll, we'll have to make a refund. So whatever yeah. month that ends up being, that'll look $50,000 less. And we'll certainly, I'll point that out when that happens. Okay. Any other comments or questions on the monthly financial reports? Art? So it looks like assessment, new assessments amounts have slowed down considerably. Uh, we had just a little bit in January and I guess we're still waiting for February, March and we're still waiting quarterly for the promenade, I guess. That's correct. Yeah, and that could just be a timing thing with the county as well, so, yep. Anything else? Okay, so we'll move those forward. 
Mike Tita? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, anything to point out in budgetary transfers? Nothing. Happy to answer questions, though. I'll answer questions on those. All right. We'll move those forward. All right. Thank you. Uh, we have a presentation on the revenue budget. Yes, we do. So, uh, oh, my, one of my favorite topics. So, thank you, Brooke. So, budget. Um, each of the each of the next four finance committee meetings, you'll receive a presentation from me on on the budget um, as we work through uh, to the to a final budget in June. Let's make sure this works here. Um, and you know, I'll start with just a quick timeline review um, in tonight I'll be focusing more on revenue so the way we'll work through it um, I'll give you an update on revenue tonight uh, I'll give you a full update on expenses in April and then May and June I'll bring it all back together and we'll talk about um, how things are trending from a, a total budget standpoint so as we develop the budget, there are a number of competing priorities that are considered, um, which ultimately boil down to a focus on providing the resources needed to achieve a quality K-12 educational program and doing that in a fiscally responsible way. Um, that's been our priority since um, I started here with, with Dr. Yanni um, doing budget work, and that will continue to be our priority as we develop the budget. So we have multiple revenue sources as a district. Um, I'm sure this is very familiar to you all, so I'll, I'll move so, through some of this quickly and then take questions at the end. Um, but we have local revenues, we have state revenues, and we have federal and other revenues. And you can see the trends here um, and how that's starting to shape up. So local makes up about 81% of total district revenues, state makes up about 18%, and federal and other make 1%, less than 1%. Um, and 22-23 local revenue is right now increasing by over $3 million, and I'll certainly walk through some of those, those details tonight. So this is just a trend that kind of shows you the charts of revenue trends by major source. You can see that local revenue here, again, is our major revenue source. The green bar is the 22-23 budget. We're up around $90 million in local revenues, and that's um, that's all of our local revenue sources, property taxes, earned income tax, transfer tax, um, all, all of those revenue sources make up that number. State revenues are a distant second uh, at $20 million, and then you almost don't even see federal and other revenues register on this chart, not to say they're not significant, um, because they're certainly meaningful to the district, they're just not material when you compare them to local and state revenues. So budget assumptions, we, we talk about this multiple times, but what is included in our revenue, uh, our revenue assumptions at this point is, um, we currently still have a 2% uh, placeholder for tax increase. And again, I say placeholder because we're still working through the expense side of the budget. So um, we, we presented a preliminary budget with a deficit of about a million dollars. We do have a couple items that are increasing significantly on the expense side of the budget. Um, like uh, transportation for uh, homeless students in the district, which I mentioned, um, gas and fuel for the district, um, spe some special education costs, but we also have some significant things that are decreasing on the expense side of the budget as well, like our medical rates are trending towards zero, no increase to potentially a reduction in rates for next year. So um, there's a lot of big things happening on the expense side of the budget, which we'll, we'll be in a better position to talk about next month. Um, interim property taxes, uh, we're maintaining at 240,000. Again, that's sort of a, we know there's new developments out there. We don't know how fast um, properties will close and we'll see the assessments come in. Um, so we're maintaining a $240,000 budget. Earned income taxes, 5.8 million. Um, the average of the last five million or five years is 5.9 million, and we're currently looking at 6.2. I have a slide to go through that, and also transfer tax. I have a slide to go through that, so I'll cover those. And then interest income, we're maintaining $75,000. So again, we talked about rising interest rates. Um, we know that'll be built in over time. Um, I think $75,000 is probably good. We are well below that this year with interest rates having been around zero for most of the year. Um, but we will continue to, to watch that closely. So this is a look at 
Act One index compared to uh, the Act One index compared to actual tax increases um, through the 21-22 year, and then 22 and 23 and beyond are projections. So you see the IFO, the increases go up on the blue line. Um, the Independent Fiscal Office is projecting Act One in indexes to increase. Whereas the orange line are, we have a 2% kind of run rate placeholder for property tax increases. So the last five years, the district has approved a tax increase that's been below the Act One index. And this year, um, the board has already adopted the resolution to stay um, at or below that, the Act One index of 3.4%. So this is a, a detail of our real estate uh, taxes as a district, and you can see um, the assessed value has increased by about $40 million, and that's primarily from our new developments that are coming online. Um, factoring in the placeholder millage of 2%, you can see that generates about tax revenue of $86.435 million. Uh, we do receive a little over $2.5 million from uh, the PA Gaming Tax Relief funds, so that goes directly back to reducing taxpayer um, tax bills. Um, net, so net taxes billed are about 83.894. We use a collection rate of about 97%, so we have a number of taxes that are um, unpaid as of the end of the year and are turned over for delinquent collection, and that gets us to our 81.377 million budgeted for property tax revenues, which is an increase of about 3 million. And what I gave you on the right there is just a reconciliation so you can see um, what's actually driving the increase, and you can see the 2% increase uh, is about 1.5 million in new revenue, um, 1.866 million is from new developments, and then we also have built in um, the reductions that we saw from the storm damaged homes, which is about 366,000. And I called that out separately just to make sure everyone's aware that will come back eventually. We just have no timeline of, of, of when those homes will be restored and when the assessments will come back. So that's where you get your total revenue increase of about $3 million on the local side. This year is a look at how assessment has changed over the year, and you can see again, this supports that we're finally starting to see some growth from our new developments. Um, but I note that here you see the reduction from 1819 and 1920, because while we're seeing new assessment come on from new developments, um, if we have large reassessments, um, and we're certainly aware uh, that the Prudential property is out there for sale, um, depending on what might happen to that as our third largest taxpayer, we could, there is potential to see reduction. So it's not just a straight line up. Um, this is an up and down movement as assessments change throughout the district. So we've certainly seen growth, um, but we're certainly watching our, our risk areas. We also know that we have new developments. Um, I've talked about that. So what, we, what this slide shows you here is the, the new developments that we know are out there. Um, what's been assessed to date, um, what's left to come in based on estimates from the township about what they expected those total developments to be assessed at when they were, full, when they were complete. And that leaves us with about $3.2 million that we know is left to be um, uh, as increases as new developments come online. So again, I take a conservative approach to this that I don't wanna try and determine how those assessments will come online. We build in assessments that are real that we've received from the county um, and, and we certainly know that we have this sitting out there and it's, it's going to be a benefit to the district in the very near future. This is just a look at EIT, um, uh, the details around how I forecast EIT, earned income tax. Um, this gives you a trend from 07, 08. The orange line is a five-year moving average of how it's trended. Um, so you can see that even though I'm increasing my budget, I still feel like it's, it is conservative to a point. So the actual has trended sort of above the five-year moving average. Um, the budget is slightly below that average, so it's it's not just a, a made up number, it's something that's based on actual data, even though we have no way to truly know what our EIT amount will be um, from year to year. So we look at trends. And the same thing with transfer tax. Um, again, you can see that similar information here, blue bars are actuals, um, orange line is the moving average, 
Um, I note that in 2122, um, we did have the one large transaction that happened, which brought in about $475,000 of transfer tax revenue. So 2122 is significantly above the average because of that one transaction. You can see 2021 was actually well below. Um, so I'm holding at 1.1 million. We also know in a rising interest rate market, um, it is likely that real estate transactions will slow down. Um, so I think it's prudent to be um, careful with that number um, and not, not have any great increase there for the budget. This is just a review of the detail. I'm certainly not gonna walk through this. It's there for reference only. These are all of our local revenue sources and trends over time, along with projections into the future. Um, if there are questions, I'm happy to answer them when, when we get to the end about any of those numbers. State and federal revenue sources uh, are made up of a number of different items. So um, total revenue from the state is around 20 million. There are multiple different items that make that up. And I think it's important to notice that almost all state revenue sources have been minor increases to small decreases. Um, and the largest increase continues to be in the PEASERS line item, right? So PEASERS, our state retirement system, um, as expenses go up, we receive 50% subsidy back from the state. Um, and, and so as the employer rate and expenses go up, we get a larger amount back. Um, the state tells us they've given us much more money because they funded that line item. Really all they're doing is funding a mandated, a mandated cost. Um, and then federal revenues, we're using flat to, um, to, to current year estimated amounts. ESSER um, is our federal stimulus funding. We have, um, right now, we're still building that out for next year. Certainly, we've got our plan developed, but right now, there is no revenue or expense built into the budget for next year. We will build that in. It will be a net zero impact um, as we develop that. Um, the largest amount of the ESSER dollars will be spent likely in the following budget year, because likely that summer will be the work that we do at one of the elementary schools um, where we set the $1.2 million aside for construction related work in those buildings to improve air quality. This is the state revenue detail. Again, this is where you can really see kind of everything remaining flat except for the PEASERS line item being the area of, of greatest increase there. So um, just good information to have. This is the state budget proposal. If anyone's familiar with the governor's budget that was uh, he proposed in February, um, there is a lot of good stuff here for education. The governor certainly supports education and funding of education. Um, I'm not gonna spend time going through this in detail because um, if you notice on the right, I say chance of the governor's budget being passed as is, is 0%. So we're not gonna spend a lot of time here, but I think it's worthwhile to note that the governor certainly does support education and funding of education. These next two slides are, again, the detail of state revenues and federal revenues. Um, again, I talked through this. I won't go through these details. They're here for reference. I will certainly answer questions on them if there are specific questions. These couple slides are slides that I, I continue to keep in, in the presentation. I reviewed it in the budget town hall that we, we did. Um, and again, what these slides show you um, are comparisons of Upper Dublin's millage rate compared to other local um, districts in Montgomery County. And again, it's, it's I think um, millage rates are a tough comparison, but they're easy to compare within counties. Once you go outside counties, um, it's not easy to compare across counties. There are some calculations out there that, that do comparisons, but it's, it's not apples to apples. Um, but the, the note on this slide here is that you can see um, Upper Dublin is um, the third highest on this chart, but 3.025 of those mills are related to the building of the high school. They were approved by the electorate, um, and those will roll off eventually starting in the 27, 28 school year. So, you know, when you roll those three mills off, it kind of brings us right, right down in the, in the middle of the, of the county here. Um, I also want you to notice, um, let's just look at the three, the two on the right side of the graph that are the lowest there. Um, so this is millage compare. When I flip to the next slide, you'll see those two that were the lowest um, are the lowest for the reason because this is assessed value by property type. So you can see that when compared, um, you know, w Wissahickon and Upper Marion, thank you, I can't read this on the slide, um, have the highest uh, assessed values along with Colonial over on the other side of the chart there. So 
they have significantly more assessment um, than what other districts in Montgomery County do, including Upper Dublin. And then when you flip to the next slide, so to finish the story, so this really shows you assessed value per pupil. So again, when you compare Upper Dublin to Wissahickon as an example, Wissahickon has about 200 to $250,000 more of assessment per pupil. So they are able to have a lower millage rate um, for a, a, you know, a similar type of service that, that Upper Dublin provides because their, their assessed value is much more significant than, than Upper Dublin is. So at this point in the process, there are still a ton of unknowns. There will be um, through the, the end of the year. There will be unknowns when we pass the budget in June, as is uh, the, the process every year. Um, but, but some of the big ones are, again, we have a, a placeholder tax increase of 2%. Um, every one-tenth of a percent change has about an $83,000 impact. So as that number changes um, based on the expenditure budget um, and, and needs of the district, um, that's the impact. We will continue to closely watch assessment appeals, um, both on the plus and negative side, right? We've got 13 open district-initiated appeals. There are a number of... Um, uh, commercial assessment appeals that are open. Um, and like I noted, we do know the Prudential property is for sale um, and as the third largest taxpayer could have a significant impact. Um, and we'll continue to watch state and federal revenue allocations. Again, sometimes the state budget um, is not passed until after we need to take final action on our budget. So we need to continue to just pay attention um, and, and make good projections um, and recommendations for our, our budget. So that's a look at our revenue budget, and I'm happy to answer whatever questions you might have. Any questions from the committee? Jenna? Andy, on that last slide, I think, and you had spoken about this a little bit earlier, I think you skipped the new development assessment increases as, as one of the unknowns. I don't know if you want to talk about that at all. Yeah, so I mean, like, like I talked about, so I, I take a conservative approach that we know there's 3.2 million roughly out there in, in new developments. As that comes online and becomes real, I will build that into the budget projections. And as I come back to the committee each month and give you updates on the budget, um, I'll certainly let you know how that's changing as we move towards a final budget. Well, and and just to follow up on that timing, because you know, I think this is this is the one that you know, folks see that number hanging out there. What, do we have any sense of what's, what's a typical, again, time horizon from the point of assessment to when we actually realize that? I mean, it, it's, it seems like it's taking a long time, but maybe that's normal. It's just I keeping a closer eye on it. So, so, so that's actually a really good point to make sure I clarify. When I talk about timing there, um, so I don't necessarily have a good sense of that. Promenade, as an example, just talking about timing from assessment to when we see it, they're only assessing that on a quarterly basis. Um, homes that are assessed, um, we may get it at a certain point, but it could be back to a certain date. So there may be a lag, but the assessment could take effect as of February 1st, as an example, based on when it came online. Timing, the big piece of timing that I'm speaking about here is, so Madison Estate, the timing of the build of those homes, um, and the timing of the completion of the promenade. So that's really more, I have no way to determine when they'll finish that or how quickly they'll build homes at Madison Estate as an example. I did have one other question, sorry. The, the note about, I'm trying to remember what slide it was on. I think it was on slide eight. The number that we have on, yeah, it's on slide eight, the, the PA gaming tax relief. Do we know that number for 2022 already? Is that, or is that just based, because obviously it's identical to what we have this year. So I didn't know if that's a, you know, what else do you pick or if that's a confirmed number? No, I, I use the number until we get an updated number. We'll get that updated number. Actually, it should be the end of, the end of April-ish. Um, so we do, we do receive that number from the state and it's a placeholder for now. And I just want to point out that we're talking about the revenue budget here, so it, you know that is sort of real, but in terms of net to the general fund, it's zero. It's always zero. It just passes through our general fund to back to the taxpayers. You have more? All right. Art. Right. With, with the gaming, Andy, if, if more homes are in Upper Dublin, uh, it does mean that each homeowner would get slightly less of, of a rebate, if I can use that term. And, and I know I know the, uh, the uh, I, I shouldn't use gambling money, but it's been a very good year for them in terms of their revenues with, with those funds. 
but it's it's a wash. And I think the problem we have is a lot of a lot of taxpayers don't even realize that it's on their bill all the time and it's reducing. But once you initiated it, it really doesn't make much of a change because it's the same amount every year, basically. So you don't really see it because it's already deducted. Is that? That those are fair statements as there's more approved homesteads, the amount per as long as our amount received from the state doesn't change much will go down. I think that's another important point is um, I don't have the year off the top of my head when this was instituted, but there's certainly been a significant amount of increase in gaming money statewide and the money that's been allocated to school districts has not changed really since this went into place. So we've not seen any increases even as th there's more and they continue to do well. And then the other observation is Prudential. We had a significant assessment appeal from Prudential. I think, do you remember percentage-wise? Was it a, was it reduced by maybe a third their assessed value? I, I don't. It was, it was, it was, it was around it was, a million dollars. It was a significant. It was a significant amount. amount. They were our largest taxpayer. Uh, right. Correct. So we already did that, and and we are, we are also we're still concerned that if somebody buys that property, I think they're buying it because they, they waited until the assessment appeal went through <laughs> and now it's on the market and it's not gonna be as significant as the appeal that we already have, but it could result in a reduction. I, I, we don't I, know. I certainly can't, can't um, <laughs> project that, but it's, it's our third largest taxpayer at about a million two. Um, and the property is currently, the implied market value of the property is around $90 million. Okay. So um, that was my next question. If, it, if it sells for something less than that, um, I think it's reasonable to expect that we would receive a, an assessment appeal on that property. Right, okay. And the, uh, the promenade, commercial properties continuing slowly to open up. Uh, do, do you know if those assessments only occur for the commercial side of it? as they open? I, I don't know how the county assesses that. They yeah. don't really tell us that. Um, okay. All we know is that they're, they're evaluating the property on a quarterly basis. Yeah. And, and I don't think our, so our, we keep our solicitor involved in the assessments that come in and I don't think anyone feels like that, you know, it's, it's out of whack right now. Right, and, and then also with the Matson Estates, it really depends not only how quickly they build it, but how quickly it goes to settlement. That, that's the key is when it goes to settlement, because if you look at the charts that Andy provides every month, not as many as you would think have been, have been settled. Although when you go online, they, they've sold a lot of their properties, so they're still building them. And Fair point, and again, I'll say, we're, we're just, my reports are based on reports I receive from the county. So right. it, it, if the county is not keeping up and we get some, you know, some backlog of, of assessments that come through, that's possible. So uh, I'm just, I'm reporting based on what the county tells me. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the other disappointing thing is when, when we look at the state revenue, I bring this up every time, 18%, uh, 20%, I think you said it was 20% now? 18%. 18%, but the greatest share of that is the PISERS return to us. It's not like the state is giving us additional money. It's just offsetting 50% of, of, of the PISERS contribute. So that's, you know, and then the other, the other small piece is IDEA does not show up as federal revenue here. It shows up, so that, that's an, another little Weird. C correct. IDEA are federal funds, but they, they're passed through the intermediate unit, so right. they actually show up as local funds. As local funds. Budget. Correct. But, yeah, and hopefully they'll be, I mean, there is talk about some increases in, in, in IDEA. Are we up to 600,000 yet, or? I, I think it's around 680, 680,000 roughly. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Other comments, questions? Andy, you, you talked about the ESSER funds being uh, a net zero in the end. Do the ESSER, w do you foresee some of the ESSER funds basically passing through the general fund to capital reserve before they get spent? And if so, is it still really a net zero? 
I'm not sure we know the answer to that right now. Um, I, I would probably just pay the bills out of the general fund um, and truly make it a net zero, but we, we can certainly figure out the accounting behind that. Um, e either way, it would be a net it would be a net zero because even if we transferred it, we would be receiving the funds in and then transferring That's it, the so they would idea. offset each other. So, but we'll, we'll work out all the accounting. I don't know those answers right now. Anyone else? Okay, so thank you for that presentation. No action to take, but we'll look forward to more of these uh, over the next several months. Uh, we have an agreement with Whistler Perlstein for next year. Yep, so th this is just our standard annual uh, renewal from Whistler Perlstein as our solicitor. Um, our recommendation is to maintain Whistler as the district solicitor. Um, there are no increases in the rates as compared to the current year. Comments or questions? Andy? What do we pay them on an annual year? I mean, this gives you a projection of, you know, there's a base and then there's per hour. What's it wind up actually being? It, it certainly depends on how much you use their services. Um, I don't have those numbers off the top of my head. I can certainly get those to the board. Um, and, and again, it's so we pay, I think it's 3,900 for the standard services, and then we pay them per hour. Um, but I can get you those numbers. Okay, so here's my other question. So they've been the solicitor since 1974. According to their, their little memo here, they've been working with the district since 1974. Anybody else ever approach the district for this type of position? Not, not that I'm aware of, but. So I recommended to the board that we move away from Whistler for special education um, several years ago um, because I thought that we could get a different level of service. And so we have Sweet Stevens for special education, but I don't believe that um, there's been any talk about uh, moving away from Whistler for general services. What we have done a number of years ago is we do release an RFP and we, we check the market. And, and that's a possibility too, and, and at any time, since it's a yearly agreement. I mean, the reason I ask is like, it's almost 50 years with one law firm, and I'm all for continuity of representation, but I mean, that, that could be a record, I don't know. So I, I just didn't know whether it's something where, you know, other firms are unaware that this is a possibility or it's just you've gotten good service over the years, so don't don't fix it if it's not broken. We'd have to release an RFP yeah, and, can and you look at the market. Maybe you can provide us with when the last time we did that was. It, it, um, it was definitely my time on the board. I don't remember what year. It's a purchase yeah. professional service, so yeah. we wouldn't have to we wouldn't have to do an RFP. Okay. It was best practice to do an RFP, right. but we wouldn't have to do an RFP. Other comments or questions on that? All right, so members of the committee, are we prepared to move that one forward? 2016 was the last time it was looked at. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, we have a residential settlement stipulation. Yep, this is just a, a small residential property settlement. It's a, an annual loss of $554. Comments or questions? Okay, we'll move that forward. All right, thank you. And that is our reports and recommendations. So we are going to move up on to public participation. No, okay. Uh, we do have one that was submitted uh, through the online form, and I will read that right now. It is from Jenny Vitella Ambler. And it is a series of six questions with some sub questions. Number one, what is the status of each of the three 90 foot baseball fields? Number two, what are the temporary solutions? Number three, when will the fields be ready for play? Number four, what is the timeline for permanent upgrades and fixes? Number five, why did the Sandy Run Middle School construction site put in a $50,000 claim due to damage from the tornado? The tornado was two miles wide that went over Fort Washington neighborhoods, Fort Washington Elementary School, Upper Dublin High School, Joel Drive, Temple Ambler, and off to Horsham. What damage was caused? Was it the result of being so close to a floodplain and the Sandy Run Creek? And number six, 
I still see the large $262,000 change order in the budget for the Sandy Run Middle School project. Are we just gonna eat this expense instead of the company being held accountable? And what are legal fees incurred to fight the ADA compliance? And that is the end of that comment. That was the only one received, so I will close public participation and see if there are any comments on the public participation. I think we addressed all of the baseball questions at the beginning of the meeting. I also know that Mr. Highland has been communicating every few days with the baseball booster parents, um, but we will make sure that um, if there are any unanswered questions that we provide uh, the answers to those. Regarding the insurance claim at Sandy Run, there that, was, yeah, there was nine inches of rain that fell in that storm and the building was not watertight. That's right. correct. And, and <laughs> do we address that tonight with some yeah. of the drainage around the building that it just, it wasn't prepared to handle that amount of rain. So it wasn't the tornado itself. It was the, it was the rain. And regarding the uh, $200,000 plus change order, we've said that that uh, could be a matter of litigation. And so therefore we're not going to make any comments on that uh, until the close of the project. Uh, to specifically answer the sort of sub-question about that claim, was it the result of being so close to a floodplain? No, it had absolutely nothing to do with being close to a floodplain. Any other comments or anything on public participation? Okay. Um, I will announce our next Finance Committee meeting will be held Wednesday, April 20th, 2022 at 6 p.m. And we are adjourned. Thank you. Thanks, Mike.